Welcome to Renegade Inc. What do you do when inflation is so high your people are having to choose between heating and eating? Well, logically, you should admit that your economic management has been poor. The reality? Western nations are now looking around the world for a war. Matthias Wake, really great to have you back on Renegade Inc. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, mate. Thanks for the invitation. About 18 months ago, two years ago, we sat in Berlin uh, and you gave a very stark warning about the global economy, specifically about inflation. Then we sat in Norway in a place called Savanger. Uh, you'd written a book, uh, which is in German. It's called The Biggest Crash Ever. Uh, and you warned everybody about the biggest crash ever and inflation. Now we're sitting together again. Uh, and turns out central bankers are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Jerome Powell recently came out and said, oh, I think there's an issue. Uh, I think inflation's out of control. So it turns out, Matthias, that you were right. Yeah, but it, it was not so hard to predict. You can't print incredible amounts of money without receiving inflation. Yeah, We see the inflation for many years on the stock markets, on the crypto markets, on the real estate markets. And now finally, the people notice it when they go shopping. We've like the ECB balance sheet quadrupled, the Fed balance sheet tripled. So the, all the money has to go somewhere. And now we see the effects and now the inflation note hits the fan. Are you shocked that these central bankers are seemingly shocked or, well, they're at least pretending to be shocked? Uh, recently, uh, beginning of this year, Jerome Powell uh, said that the US national debt is on an unsustainable path. It's growing faster than the economy. Well, it wouldn't take a genius to work out if you printed all that money, then that's going to happen because ultimately that money is going to find its way into land prices, uh, asset bubbles, well, the bubble everything. Yes, it, it, it was not difficult to predict, and um, but you must see it like this. Um, we had a really good time since 2009, since the crash of Lehman Brothers, and we had a great party. And who wants to be the guy on a party that turns off the music and switches on the lights? <laughs> yeah? So uh, you have to understand them. Like a lot of people got really rich in the past years, like the super rich more than doubled their wealth. So um, it's no wonder, like... Um, like you see a massive divide between poor and rich and super rich. And so those people said, come on, keep on printing money. We've got a massive profit from it. And, and most of the people didn't notice it. And some had, had a little flat or a small house and oh, it's great. My house has doubled. But now they go to the petrol station or to the supermarket and notice, ouch. Now it's getting really, really expensive. And like heaps of people in Germany, if they get like the final bill in spring, what they use for heating for their houses, they'll get a massive shock. And we've got even in Germany, the highest electricity prices in the world. And so there will be a lot of turmoil. On Twitter, the Twitter no less, uh, there is not Jerome Powell tweeting. Uh, and um, he is claiming that Jerome Powell uh, should be called 007. Uh, zero rate rises, zero reasons for tapering, and $7 trillion printed. That pretty much is his CV, isn't it? Yeah, you can say it like this, but don't just blame it on him because they had the decision if they wouldn't have printed so much money, our economy wouldn't be there where it is now. But now they've got the problem if they stop printing money, the share markets, the crypto markets, the real estate markets will go down and people lose their jobs. Yeah, But if they keep on printing, the inflation will go through the roof. So it, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It will always be the wrong decision. OK, so let's um, say that um, they, they are all in it together. So they've got diffuse responsibility. We can't single out just Jay Powell, right? Um, we were told after 2008, and this is something that we've touched on before, that QE was a temporary measure and we're going to use it as a temporary measure so we can fix the fundamental structural problems within the economy. Well, it turns out that it hasn't been a temporary measure at all. It's now become an economic, a permanent economic tool. Shouldn't there have been some foresight with policymakers to say, actually, we're going to use this until this moment, and then we have to wean our way off what is the easiest route out? It's, it, it, I always said it. It's tricky to say, do you want to be the guy who is on a party and turns off the music and switches on the light? Um, for sure, they should have done it, and everybody knows if you print money, 
you can postpone a problem, but you can't solve it. But now we are so far that I think, what, what can it do now? They, they can say, okay, we keep on printing money, inflation will go through the roof. We stop printing money, the share markets, the crypto markets, real estate markets will go down. What I expect, what they probably will do is they'll increase the interest rates by a bit and a bit, and then they see, okay, the stock markets will go down and the big pension funds in America won't be happy. Yeah? And so then they will go down with, with the interest rates again further and further, and we make the bubble bigger and bigger until it finally bursts. I think we won't see in the long run higher interest rates like we had seen like in the 80s and 90s, no way, because if we do that, we should think um, they're not just um, private households, they're governments, they're all the zombie um, enterprises. Um, how should they pay the interest rates? If we have, for example, an interest rate in America or in, in Britain or in the Eurozone of four or five percent, that won't work out. We'll never ever see high interest rates again. When you uh, compare then interest rates, which were high in the 80s um, to now, uh, something that uh, policymakers and central bankers don't often talk about, or in fact ever talk about, because it's ultimately the banking model, is that there wasn't so much private debt in the economy in the 80s as there is now. As soon as you start tweaking interest rates, you, the economy capitulates because of all the stuff that we know. And all the stuff we know is we've got subprime auto, we've got sub subprime uh, real estate, we've got margin debt uh, for the stock market, we've got crypto out, out of the job. All these things, all these exotic financial products that weren't there in the 80s, how different does that make it a landscape for the central banker to try and navigate? Super difficult that you have to imagine like that we had a massive crypto boom the past two years and they were not just smart investors, they were also investors who said, okay, I go to the bank and get a loan of 20 grand and I buy some Bitcoins or Ethereum for that and now they're in the and the other problem is like we've got the, the I say well, we're living in a leasing society. Like when I grew up, you know, you had like five German marks and you can buy something for five German marks. Now you've got five euros and you can buy something for 10 euros. Like people lease their cars, their houses owned by the, the bank, the girls have leased their, their handbags, the watch is leased. It's all not used anymore. It's all a big bubble and we pretend to live a lifestyle a lot of people can't afford. And this is the craziness. And if that bubble bursts, we've got much bigger problem than we would have had prob probably in the 80s or the 70s. Is that bubble bursting now? This is tricky to say. Like um, for me, like the aha effect was the past two years that things with the corona politics, things can happen we can't imagine, yeah? So maybe they even print more and we on the other side, we have to see there are a lot of assets for what people have. So you can raise taxes big time, like taxes are still low and you, you can make um, taxes of all your wealth and all this stuff like, um, they, they probably play the game as long as they can. I think the, if they increase the rates, definitely the stock market bubble and the crypto market bubble will burst. So what's the, and I'm only asking you to predict the future. Um, so what we'd see is interest rates go up, stock market comes down, crypto comes down. Um, what then, what's the next one to go? Would that be real estate? What's the, what's the, because ultimately I know that you don't know this, but what, from a sequencing point of view, how do these things crash? Because it's never an orderly landing, is it? It's always no. a, a sharp, hard landing. Yeah, I think um, if they raise the interest rates, the first the uh, um, the asset the asset markets will, like the share markets will rock rock down, and then the crypto markets parallel, and a, a while later it will probably hit the real estate market. The man and um, woman in the street um, realise intuitively uh, and when they think about uh, what's going on in the global economy, they realise that the stock market and certainly crypto and all this other exotic stuff, it isn't the real economy. And they face a really uh, difficult choice, certainly in the UK at the moment. Uh, you can divide it between eating and heating. We've got soaring energy prices. Same here. And, and in Germany too, and across Europe. From an energy security point of view, you've uh, had a pipeline put in your country called Nord Stream 2. And it seems to me that people throughout Europe want cheap gas. Why do you think there's been so much pushback by the Americans to Nord Stream 2, especially because it's implemented by the Russians? Oh, maybe it's just because they want to make business and they've got their, cheap, their fracking gas they have to sell as well and so now the tankers from the states come to europe and 
um, yeah, it's all about business. And um, wh why should the Americans support that Russia sells gas to Germany if they can sell gas to Germany as well? Well, uh, let's look at the environmental aspect of this and the uh, business case. How can you ship gas across the Atlantic to uh, the west coast of Europe cheaper than you can run it through a pipeline from No, Russia. you can't. And it is not cheaper, but uh, a friend of mine said, never ask the why question, because there's so many things that make no sense. And um, it's all about power. And the American said, why, why do you make our enemy stronger? Yeah. And that's what it's all about. It makes no sense. Um, like gas is always dirty, but uh, fracking gas is definitely dirtier. You know, the pollution, what they have in, in the States when, when they do the fracking process, it's a disaster for the environment. And we need the gas like we electricity city doesn't come out of the plug it comes out of a power station and we can decide do we have nuclear power stations do we have gas do we have um, wind do we have sun but the problem is like if I probably similar in England like last November here it was cloudy and we had no wind but we still need electricity so we have to think where it should come from um, and we can't get everything especially in Germany from alternative energies seems to me that there's a pragmatism in Germany, though, with that economic reality uh, staring you in the face. Uh, and Olaf Scholz, your uh, chancellor, knows this, uh, that uh, ultimately taking cheaper gas from Russia is going to be a way better economic option than shipping it from the US. Uh, has he been able to sell that to the Americans? I don't know yet. Um, I'm not a big fan of the our new chancellor, and I don't know what he's actually doing. He's he's not saying much, and we've got another thing. We've got the Greens in power, and um, I can't follow their plan because it makes economically no sense what they are doing. But they should think about the environment. But if we ruin our economy, um, it won't help the environment as well. Do you think, coming back to the central banking uh, and monetary policy issues, um, having touched on energy security, do you think that bankers, central bankers, realise that juicing asset prices in the way that they have ultimately always leads to a devaluation of the currency? And if we want a, a, a real world example of that, look at Australia. It's tricky to say, but it's probably right. I, but what... what the, if you see it now in the United States, if they rise the interest rates, the dollar will go up, the euro will stay down. Um, but we import also like we have to import gas, oil, steel. We've got no natural resources in Germany. I don't know if it is so sensible for the economy. How does uh, the man or woman on the street now protect themselves, bearing in mind that we've just been through this pandemic, it's been two years of this stuff. A lot of people- oh, We are still in, in Germany, we're still in, Germany, in the pandemic, still in. big time. <laughs> Gosh, good luck. Uh, the only, only New Zealand is more balmy. Um, but, um, but bearing in mind that a lot of people have been furloughed, a lot of people have lost jobs, You know, because often when I say on this program, how do people protect themselves against inflation? People say, oh, well, go out and buy precious metals or go and buy hard assets, wine, real estate. People can't do that. They just simply can't do it. How does man or woman on the street who's doing an honest shift day in, day out, how do they protect themselves for what's coming down the track? If, if an ounce of gold is too expensive, buy an ounce of silver. That, that's like, I don't know, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. So you can afford that and don't make any debt because debt you have to pay back. And that will be even harder in the future to, to pay back your debt. Live with a lifestyle you can afford and not you pretend to afford. And would you say to pay off debt now while the sun is still kind of shining? Because is it going to get a lot gloomier? Uh, I'm, I'm, for me, the biggest thing is health and freedom. And if I've got debt, I'm not free. That's why I don't have debt. Alex Cranier, great to have you back on Renegade Inc. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Alex, tell us, the, it was the Scottish writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, who said, sooner or later, everybody sits down to a banquet of consequences. You and others have been warning about inflation and loose monetary policy for many, many years. Is this the banquet of consequences that you were warning about? I'm afraid so. Uh, I think that we've come to the point where uh, inflation has become entrenched uh, the central bankers have only one tool left, and that is QE, quantitative easing, which is just a fancy word for printing money. And uh, basically, uh, they will not abandon that one uh, 
policy tool and what we'll get what we what we'll end up getting is a, a period of stagflation and the inflation will probably at, over the years accelerate and could even turn into a hyperinflation stagflation just explain it well uh, stagflation is uh, basically coined uh, the word coined out of stagnation and inflation basically so you have very poor economic growth and at the same time you have rising inflation unlike you know like uh, if we could if we could name that a benign kind of inflation is what you what you have when uh, econo- the economic system is growing there's growing demand for products and services which uh, bid up uh, prices gradually and slowly over time so you have inflation with healthy economic growth but when you get like a very sluggish economic growth or no growth at all but inflation keeps rising that's where you have stagflation this is a this is let's say like a typical outcome of uh, monetary policy uh, going overboard, printing far too much money, debts uh, getting uh, un- to unpayable levels. And the outcome is uh, practically baked into the system from the beginning. But we are now at the point where the bankers are scrambling to do something about it. But they, all, all they can do, the only tool they have at their disposal is printing money. So more debt monetization, printing more debt to solve a debt crisis. Even the biggest cheerleader of this system knows that that is nonsensical. Oh, they know that it's nonsense. They they just have no choice because uh, if they stop printing, uh, we get a deflationary collapse. We get a we get a, a economic depression. Uh, by printing, they gain time because the unraveling is is never you know it never happens overnight. Well, it usually doesn't happen overnight, but uh, it gives them time to finagle to try to muddle through and think up some kind of another solution, preferably. Uh, you know, they could get start, uh, some kind of a war started uh, to distract everybody away from their problems and to maybe blame all of the problems on the uh, external adversary. Uh, but printing money doesn't create prosperity. It doesn't solve any of the economic issues. It, it only makes them worse. But for the central bankers, it buys them time. Do you think that that is a real option for, for instance, America now? Uh, America has uh, inflation now hitting 7%, same in the UK, uh, first time in nearly 40 years. We've seen some of the pictures out of America. In fact, you've tweeted some, um, one of them saying, wow, Flavella's in California. Uh, But we've also seen trains being robbed of Amazon packages and medical um, uh, packages going to people. Do you think that the internal collapse now, because of the uh, crisis of living over there, is a very real reason for people in Washington to go around the world and try and find a war uh, to uh, say, well, actually, it wasn't us. It was uh, these other people over here. And that's why your living standards are squeezed. I, I think you touch on a great, po- a great point. And I think it's uh, hugely relevant to discuss this because the, the, the monetary system that we have, it's a fraudulent monetary system. It's it's it has crises baked into it. It's uh, it's it's extremely crisis prone, but worse than that, it has a, a strong tendency to move societies towards war. Uh, I would remind your viewers that when uh, um, you know Bank of England was created in 1694, and then since sev- between 1701 until 1815. Uh, England prosecuted 18 officially declared wars against its uh, rival France at that time. That's not a coincidence, you know, and uh, you had you had the U.S. Congressman Ron Paul say that there's, it's no coincidence that the century of central banking has coincided with the century of total war. And we even had, you know, in the more, more modern times, we had the a study published in the Journal of Public Health in the United States, where the researchers tallied up all the wars that have been prosecuted in the world between 1946, so after World War II, until 2001. And they found that the United States initiated fully 80% of all those wars. So, you know, every time there is a war scare on the horizon, there's a rationale behind, behind it, you know, like now, uh, you know, Saddam has weapons of mass destruction, we have to kill him. Uh, then, you know, we have to stop the madman Gaddafi, then uh, Bashar al-Assad is killing his own people. Today, we have to protect uh, Ukraine from the evil Hitler Putin. 
but the you know the fact that 80% of wars have always been initiated by one side in this uh, equation needs an explanation and the explanation is systemic it's not about putin it's not about saddam it's not about uh, any of these leaders is the fact that the west needs war and it it seeks out war and now we're seeking out war against russia and war would be a beautiful um distraction for from all the other problems uh and you know the the war creates that kind of an emergency that allows the ruling establishment to get away with all kinds of crimes and uh, you know silencing of dissent silencing of opposition uh rationing food rationing fuel uh and and so forth you name it anything they anything they want they can get under that kind of an emergency it takes an enormous amount of manufacturing the consent necessary to be able to go to war. And it seems to me, we just look at this um, Daily Telegraph headline, Russia is ready to kill us by the thousands. And that was when uh, that guy, Gavin Williamson, was um, lurking around the Foreign Office. Uh, now, this has been a boiling the frog media campaign, hasn't it? It's just been drip, drip, drip for a very, very long time. You actually go back to the Maiden 2014 Ukraine and people like Victoria Newland and all the uh, neocons in uh, America, they have been pushing slowly but surely. And then suddenly they've got uh, a weak leader in power in the White House. It's basically, well, the cat's away, the mice will play. And they are playing now. Is this not a huge worry that you've got incredibly immature uh, uh, hotheads who are the neocons in the US pushing and pushing and pushing for this massive uh, blow up in Ukraine when NATO when truth be told, doesn't want Ukraine. Yeah, well, uh, you have a point. Uh, the, the leaders generally in the West are very low caliber people, which means that they can be pushed around and coerced by the interests that are, uh, you know, uh, superior to them in the whole uh, hierarchy of uh, command and control in the West. And this def def definitely represents a danger uh, but I, I do hope that the cooler heads will prevail eventually because it's a very, very small segment of the population uh, that may get, gain any benefit from war. Whereas everybody else, uh, even if they don't, if, if they, if, even if they can't see clearly what's coming, they understand that war is a lose-lose situation for 99.99% of the population. Mm. But the 0.1%, uh, namely the people who benefit from the military industrial complex, namely the people who are uh, in hoc uh, to all of these um, arms companies, namely all the people who write for and push these right-wing think tanks uh, in the US and other places, all of them benefit massively. Yeah, that's correct. But, you know, I have to say that this time around, I'm uh, more optimistic that we are going to be able to arrest the progression to war than we could have been uh, in the in in the build up to World War One and World War Two. And uh, part of part of the reason why is because uh, you know back then you know the public depended on newspapers, radio, and television for their information, and those sources of information were very easy to control uh, by the central pl planners. Today we have. Uh, very, very lively social media uh, universe uh, where people are exposed to different kinds of information. It's very difficult for them to control the narrative at this point. And we can see that there are cracks uh, appearing in the Western resolve to go and confront Russia in spite of all the the narratives, the you know refer references to the appeasement in 1938 and so forth. And so I, I see that they have a great deal of trouble uh, putting together a coalition of people that are actually willing to wage war on Russia. They've lost control of the narrative. Uh, yeah, I, it seems to me that they have lost control of the narrative and they're only trying to push harder. But as they push harder against uh, what I see as a rising tsunami of opposition, uh, their narrative is getting more and more incoherent. This system careens from war to war. The reasons, the pretexts are shifting and changing, but the, the drive for war continues. And this is why we have this state of permanent war today. It's, a, it's, it's, it's systemic. It's not just about Ukraine's border. It's not just about US borders. It's, um, it's something deeply rotten about the system.
How much envy do you think there is amongst Western leaders and central bankers when they look at the management, for instance, of the Russian economy, um, almost debt free, massive gold reserves? Do they look at that and think, actually, uh, instead of printing all this money, we should have been financially a lot more conservative? Well, I think the Western leaders should be envious of the rush of the state of the Russian economy, but I think you give them too much credit. I don't. I don't think that they are even in, sufficiently in touch with reality to recognize them. You know, I listen to them, and they keep insisting that uh, Russia is about to unravel, that its economy is weak. They still think that Russia depends on uh, exports on oil and gas; otherwise, it's going to implode. Uh, they still think that. Uh, you know, the state of stock market reflects uh, the, the state of um, the economy in the West and that our ec ec economy is strong. I don't know who fills them with those uh, talking points, but it appears that they uh, actually believe them. And so, I, yeah, you're right that they should be envious, that they should follow that example, but I don't think that they're actually able to uh, wrap their minds around that. I think I probably know the answer to this question, uh, but uh, what can we all do uh, that uh, stops the war machine in its tracks? I think the most important thing that we can do is is uh, speak the truth. That's you know uh, the preamble of uh, in the preamble of the of the charting document of uh, set up document of the UNESCO said that conditions for war are created in the minds of men. In, in, in the, it's in the minds of men that uh, conditions for peace have to be defended. And I think that today we can add other genders to that statement, but I think that the principle remains the same. It's, uh, it's always the war for people's minds. If we refuse to go to war, war is not gonna happen. Alex Crania, always great to have you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure.